let me start with a presidential election. Uh, in 1828, two candidates for the presidency faced off against each other. On one side was the incumbent, the sitting president running for re-election, John Quincy Adams, the son of old John Adams. Uh, Quincy Adams himself was, without a doubt, the most distinguished American uh, statesman in 1828, perhaps the most distinguished statesman the United States has ever produced. Uh, not only was he the son of a president, he had been groomed uh, for, for office, for public service, almost from the day of his birth. Uh, he was an accomplished scholar. He had not only attended Harvard University, he had been a professor at Harvard University. Uh, he was a brilliant writer. Uh, he was an amateur scientist and poet of some note. Uh, he knew several languages, classical and modern. He had served a long apprenticeship in the United States Senate uh, and as a diplomat abroad. He was one of the diplomats who helped negotiate the Treaty of Ghent, ending the, ending the War of 1812, uh, regarded as a diplomatic triumph. Uh, and then he had culminated all that with eight brilliant years as Secretary of State under President James Monroe. Uh, he was largely responsible for what we call the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, he's generally regarded by diplomatic historians as the best Secretary of State the United States ever had. That's on one side. Remember, he's the incumbent, too. On the other side was Andrew Jackson of Tennessee, rough-hewn child of the frontier. Uh, Jackson had been a Tennessee lawyer and judge, but he had almost no formal education. Uh, he could write English forcefully, though not very grammatically. He had trouble spelling words like the. <laughs> uh, he didn't know any foreign languages at all, ancient or modern. He had never been out of the United States. Uh, he was a great military hero from his victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. Uh, but he had served only briefly in a series of political posts without distinguishing himself in any of them. While John Quincy Adams spent his spare time in the study pondering deep thoughts, uh, Andrew Jackson spent his spare time at the racetrack watching his thoroughbreds run. Uh, Adams read the classics in the original Greek and Latin. Andrew Jackson read newspapers. Well, by all odds, this should have been no contest at all. But in this storied campaign of it, you had one of the perhaps the most qualified person ever running for president of the United States against somebody who apparently had no qualifications almost at all. But in this storied campaign in 1828, Jackson's handlers turned all of Adams's advantages against him. They denounced him as an effete aristocrat, a pointy-headed intellectual, out of touch with the American people, a Washington insider, uh, there wasn't a Beltway yet, so they didn't call him an inside the Beltway politician, but if there had been, they would have. Uh, and on the other side, they whipped up enthusiasm for Andrew Jackson, the people's candidate, Old Hickory, with that endearing nickname, uh, and they whipped up enthusiasm for him with an endless succession of parades, picnics, barbecues, pageants, rallies. Didn't talk about what Jackson would do when he was elected president, but just about who he was, the people's man, Old Hickory. Jackson was elected easily. It wasn't close. And American politics has never been the same since. Well, Andrew Jackson became in his lifetime, and he remains today, a potent symbol of American democracy, indeed the most potent symbol of American democracy uh, that our politics has ever produced. And the era that bears Jackson's name, the Jacksonian era or the age of Jackson, appears in the history books as the time when American democracy fully flowered. That image isn't only a new image. It's not only a retrospective image. It was one that was current at the time, and it was kind of fixed in our national consciousness uh, by a Frenchman, a man named Alexis de Tocqueville, a French aristocrat. Uh, who came to the United States, toured the United States in the middle of Jackson's presidency in 1831 and 1832, then went back to France and wrote a two-volume work called Democracy in America. And Tocqueville's basic theme was, I have seen the future. I've come to the United States, and the United States is democracy. Uh, as Tocqueville put it, he found the United States to be the image of democracy itself 
with its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions. Tocqueville also said the people rule in the American political world. The people rule as God rules in the universe. They are the cause and the aim of all things. Everything comes from them. Everything is absorbed in them. Now this is Tocqueville coming from Europe where all the countries, all the countries that count are still monarchies. Uh, and by the way, Tocqueville didn't like a lot of what he saw in the United States. He was not a particular enthusiast for democracy, but his message to his fellow Frenchmen was, this is what's coming. Democracy is the future. We have to deal with it whether we like it or not. It's unavoidable, and if you want to see what the future looks like, go to the United States. To democracy represented the, uh, the United States rather, represented the democratic future. Europe represented the aristocratic past. Well, Jackson and his, President Jackson, after his election in 1828, and his political followers were happy to proclaim themselves uh, as carriers of democracy. But they used that word in a particular sense, not only to talk about the United States, but to talk about their own political party. Not only, they used the word democracy, Jackson and his political followers did, not only to distinguish the United States from Europe, which is the way Tocqueville used it, but instead to exalt their own political party over its opponents. Over the course of his eight years as president, Jackson reshaped that personal following that had elected him in 1828 into a mass political party. And I want to emphasize this because the textbooks often get it wrong. You sometimes see that the Democratic Party elected Andrew Jackson in 1828. There was no Democratic Party in 1828. The people who elected Jackson called themselves Jackson men. Jackson created the Democratic Party from the White House during his two terms. Now, today we call it the Democratic Party. Organizationally, it's the same political party. It's the oldest mass political party in the world. But Jackson and his followers, in fact, when they originally named it, didn't call it the Democratic Party. They called it something much more grandiose. They called it the American democracy the American democracy, suggesting that their party is the people itself. We are the democracy. And if we're the democracy, anybody who opposes us has to be, in the language of that day, if you're the democracy, the other guys are the aristocracy. And so Jackson and his political followers use this word democracy, again, not just to contrast the United States with Europe, but to contrast themselves, to say, we are the people. We are the people's party. We are the people themselves. We are the democracy. Anybody who opposes us politically, even though they're Americans, is the aristocracy. Well, historians ask one basic question about all these uses of the word democracy, and that is, are they justified? Did America really become more democratic in Andrew Jackson's day? Did Tocqueville get it right? And if it did become more democratic in Jackson's day, could Jackson and his political followers claim credit for it? Was it really their doing? Jackson's unique among presidents. In fact, oh, it's up now. It's turned on. And here we are. Jackson's unique among American presidents. In fact, he's unique among everybody in having a whole era of American history named after him, the Jacksonian era or the age of Jackson. And so another way to phrase this question is, is that name meaningful? Why do we call it the age of Jackson? Should it be called the age of Jackson? So let me first look at politics. If opening up the right to vote to more people and developing a political style that appeals to the masses against the elites. If that's democracy, then America was becoming more democratic. There's no question about it. Back at the time of the revolution, the col in the colonies, if uh, to own vote, you not only had to be an adult, usually white male, free, uh, but you also had to own property. By the 1820s, many states had eliminated and other states were reducing property qualifications for voting. They were opening up the vote to all free white men, at least. New states that came into the Union just started out with universal white male suffrage, technical phrase, to begin with. They didn't have any property qualifications to, to get rid of. Uh, states 
were giving you and me the right to vote for president. As you may know, there is no provision for a popular vote for president in the United States Constitution. If the great state of Texas wanted to take away your right to vote for president tomorrow, it could do so. It's not very likely. According to the Constitution, the state legislature decides how the presidential electors are to be chosen. In the early years of the Republic, the state legislature simply chose them themselves. In effect, the legislature cast the state's vote for president. Uh, in 1800, only two states had popular votes for president at all. By 1832, every single state except South Carolina did. That's more democracy. Also, the word democracy was uh, becoming a positive word. Uh, it was turning from uh, a slur or an epithet into a kind of slogan. Earlier generations of Americans had kind of cringed at the word democracy. It had nasty connotations of monarchy, uh, not monarchy, anarchy, or mob rule, you know, the, uh, the people in the streets destroying things. They preferred the more sedate word republic to describe the United States. But by 1830 or so, when Jackson again and his, and his followers choose a name, they embrace that word democracy. Well, this broadening of political participation certainly benefited Andrew Jackson, certainly benefited him uh, that in most states, most adult, most or all adult free white males could vote because he was a popular guy. What did Jackson and his party have to do with actually causing any of these changes that I just mentioned? Absolutely nothing. They were done at the state level. They were done over a period of time. They were well entrained before Jackson ran for president. It was, certainly was true that once he became president, uh, Jackson made reclaiming the government for the people uh, a major theme of his presidency. He replaced many long-serving government office holders with new men, uh, and his rationale for that, in his words, in a country where offices are created solely for the benefit of the people, no man has any more intrinsic right to official station than another. Every man a voter, every man a potential uh, government job holder. Jackson called this policy rotation in office. Keep rotating people so that more and more people, no, I do not have 10 minutes, uh, uh, and touted it as essential to prevent an aristocratic office holding class from uh, fastening its grip on government. Now, Jackson's opponents noted that whenever he kicked somebody out of office, he put one of his political supporters uh, in, and they called this policy the spoil system. Jackson framed his most famous political battle, his crusade against the Bank of the United States, this is the second Bank of the United States, as a conflict between the hard-working people and the moneyed aristocrats. Now, he did think the bank was unconstitutional, and he said some of the same things that Jefferson had said, but he also said this in vetoing the Second Bank of the United States. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful, meaning the bank stockholders, too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Wow, the President of the United States said that. Jackson said that the... Uh, claimed to be speaking for what he called the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers uh, against the moneyed aristocrats. He returned to this theme in his farewell address in 1837. It says something about Jackson's self, sense of self-importance that he delivered a farewell address. The only president who had done this before that was George Washington. Uh, and in his farewell address, Jackson said that the planter, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer Today, we would say hard-working, middle-class American families. The planter, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer, the bone and sinew of the country, those were his phrases, were in constant danger of losing their proper influence in government uh, and, indeed, their control over their own lives to what Jackson called a moneyed interest controlling a multi, uh, a moneyed interest consisting, rather, of a multitude of corporations with exclusive privileges. I think we call that class warfare today. Uh, Jackson, as president, also linked uh, democracy to uh, the idea of nationalism in his proclamation against the South Carolina nullifiers, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, he did uh, argue forcefully that the United States was 
Today we would say one nation indivisible. We're a nation, we're not a compact of states. You are first and foremost Americans, not South Carolinians. And lastly, he linked the idea of democracy uh, to that of a strong president as the people's tribune in government. Now this is a link we've become accustomed to, but it's by no means self-evident. As you may know, the founding generation was very, very suspicious uh, of executive authority. In 1834, the United States Senate issued a formal censure against Jackson. By the way, that's never happened since. Uh, formally censured President Andrew Jackson for removing the government's money from the Bank of the United States without proper congressional authority. And Jackson responded uh, by uh, sending to the Senate a formal protest in which he said, in so many words, who are you to censure me? The people didn't elect you, which was true. Senators were elected by state legislators, uh, legislators at that time. And Jackson said, the president, he didn't have the gall to say I, he said the president, third person like we're talking about somebody else, uh, is the direct representative of the American people. It's a startling phrase. It also, of course, was not literally true uh, because he wasn't elected directly by the people and we still, as you probably know, don't have a direct popular vote for president. Uh, to be fair to Jackson, he thought we should. Uh, and in every single one of his eight annual messages, what we would call State of the Union messages to Congress, he recommended a straight up popular vote for president, get rid of the Electoral College. Well, Jackson's own words then uh, seem to suggest uh, that his party deserved to be called the American democracy, that they were uh, representing the Demo uh, American people against the aristocrats. Uh, but historians never take anybody's word for anything, especially when the anybody is a politician uh, and the word is an appeal for popularity. So now I'm going to turn this around and look at that same idea more critically. Go back to the 1828 election. It's hard to deny Jackson's great personal popularity. Yet it's also hard to overlook the sectional nature of the election. I said it wasn't close and it wasn't. Jackson took every southern state and a minority of northern states. If you break the election into two elections, a free state election and a, and a slave state election, Jackson wins the slave state election unanimously. Adams wins the free state election fairly. Later on, by the, certainly by 1860, Jackson's Democratic Party had become nothing more than an alliance of southern slaveholders and their northern allies and apologists. And there are historians who argued that that's really what it was all along. Uh, that the Jackson's democracy is really a slaveholders party. You can also tease that word, how did I, I went the other direction. You can also tease that word, the people. When Jackson talks about the people, who does he mean? Like most politicians say, he means those people who can vote. That means adult, white, free males. Doesn't mean Cherokee Indians. It doesn't mean women of any uh, color or ethnicity. It does, certainly does not mean slaves. It does not mean free black people. And in fact, it didn't even mean uh, adult, free, white male voters if they happened to oppose Jackson. Uh, Jackson, since he really did believe, by the way, that his party represented the true American people, uh, if his party happened to lose, he had a simple explanation, the election's been stolen. The people would never vote against themselves. There are more people than there are aristocrats. Uh, therefore, we should win every single election. And if we don't, it's because the other side cheated. Uh, Jackson was not a good loser. Let's also question uh, that idea of uh, that a strong presidency naturally goes together with democracy. Uh, Jackson's presidential style was, in the words of one admiring biographer, dynamic and aggressive. Jackson vetoed more bills than all of his predecessors put together. He bullied his cabinet. He faced down foreign powers. He defied Congress and the courts. In the end, he always got his way. What a wonderful guy. Uh, what a stirring figure, uh, yet is unrestrained political power, presidential power, really such a good thing? In fact, isn't that why we have impeachment? In ancient Greece and Rome, and indeed in Jackson's day too, uh, 
Such people were called tyrants. Now, Jackson didn't think of himself as a tyrant, and Jackson and his opponents would have answered, no, I'm no tyrant because I'm just acting for the good of the people. That's what tyrants always say. It's always their justification. Go into political parties. Jackson built a political party, and I want to emphasize again that he built it in office to implement the people's will, as he said. Under Jackson and his advisor and his successor, Martin Van Buren, Democrats pioneered in techniques of party organization and discipline, which they justified as a means of ensuring the people's ascendancy over the aristocrats. To nominate candidates and adopt platforms, they perfected a structure of local, state, and national party uh, committees and conventions and caucuses topped with a national presidential nominating convention, the type we still have. These ensured coordinated action, supposedly reflected opinion at the grassroots, uh, and yet their movements were often directed from Washington. In 1836, the Democrats implemented this whole uh, apparatus in order to nominate Martin Van Buren for the presidency. Why? Because Andrew Jackson wanted him to be the next president. This raises some uh, disturbing and still very relevant questions about our political system. Are parties really such a good thing? Are parties a way to ascertain and implement the people's will or to manipulate and thwart it? Do we really get the candidates we deserve uh, and the ones we want at election time? And is partisanship really compatible with patriotism? How many of you are Republicans and want the unemployment rate to go down below 5% in Nove by November? None of you. <laughs> because Obama's a cinch for re-election if it happens. And the Founding Fathers worried, by the way, about all these things. These are perennial questions, but there were questions that the, this is the reason why the Founding Fathers were many of them skittish about political parties. What about those who were excluded, and, and they're already flashing numbers at me, and so I am going to mention these things very quickly. Uh, I, I've already mentioned uh, several of them. When, I will pick out one, and you're going to hear more about this later, when an overwhelming majority of Cherokees rejected a removal treaty that Jackson had tried to jam down their throats, did he say, ah, this is democracy at work? <laughs> no, he said, they don't know what's good for them, and I do, uh, and I'm going to get this treaty through the Senate, which he did, and I'm going to enforce it upon them by military force if necessary, uh, because I know what's best for them. And that led, actually, after Jackson's uh, presidency uh, to the forced uh, migration of the Cherokees that we know as the, the Trail of Tears. Uh, slaves, Jackson was a slaveholder, owned slaves, bought slaves, sold slaves, grew rich by uh, their labors, had some fondness for a handful of them who worked on his plantation and lived in the big house. Uh, did Jackson ever think seriously about slavery? Did he ever think seriously about the contradiction in a great Democrat holding slaves? No. Uh, Jackson, and he's about the only public figure of the time who didn't think about it. <laughs> uh, Jackson wasn't much for, uh, you might say, troubling himself with questions that he didn't see any reason to trouble himself with. Well, you can then look at Jacksonian democracy and say, gee, white man's democracy, is this democracy, is it fundamentally democratic, is it fundamentally egalitarian, or is it fundamentally racist and sexist? <laughs> What's the essence of it? Is the essence of it that it's including more free w white men and kind of empowering them and honoring them, or is the essence of it that it is drawing higher and higher boundaries between who is in the political sphere and who is outside of it? with a great majority of actual American people being outside of it. So we could well question Jackson's claim and his party's claim to be the carriers of American democracy. But you can go back to the other, and now I'm going to go back to the other. Uh, the idea of democracy not as a partisan agenda, uh, but instead as a kind of spirit of the age. I'm going to go back to Tocqueville. Tocqueville saw a democratic, egalitarian, popular, participatory nature going on all across the country. Uh, he noticed the way Americans create associations to do things. Whenever Americans wanted to do things, start a school, start a hospital, uh, 
stop drinking. Abolish slavery. How did they do it? They'd call a public meeting. Everybody would come. Uh, they'd pass resolutions. They'd go to door to door. Uh, they'd print out membership cards. I carry about 30 membership cards in my wallet, and probably you do too. Uh, Tocqueville saw Americans participating in what we call popular culture. Uh, and to him, this was something strange and different, because in Europe, culture was the province of an elite. The poor people, the regular people, aren't supposed to have any culture. If Whatever they have in culture, they take their cues from up above. We can see this democratic spirit uh, permeating uh, American society everywhere, cropping up everywhere, including a lot of activities that Andrew Jackson uh, and his party didn't approve of, like mass petition campaigns uh, to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. Jackson indeed tried to suppress these petitions uh, in mass uh, uh, campaigns to, to uh, uh, moderate drinking, to observe the Sabbath, and particularly in religious revivals. Uh, there was a great religious revival at this time. Historians sometimes call it the Second Great Awakening. Uh, preachers fanned out throughout the country, many of them not well educated, speaking to people in their own language and judging not only the effectiveness of their preaching, but the truth of their doctrines by how many converts they got. This is an interesting idea, that if you go out and preach and people don't listen to you or don't pay attention to you or don't convert to the brand of Christianity you're selling, you better change your religious principles. The people rule, not, on, not only on, on the ground, but, but you might say up above as well. One of the great evangelists of the day, uh, Charles Grandison Finney, explicitly compared his technique of winning converts to that of a politician seeking votes. This is uh, George Caleb Bingham painting uh, called Stump Speaking, and this is part of a series that Bingham did, including the one that's on the cover of your, uh, uh, your institute packet. And this, by contrast, is a picture of a Methodist camp meeting. And notice the similarities here. They're both open-air events. Uh, in both cases, you have somebody uh, speaking to the crowd, or some people speaking to the crowd. Notice that everybody's there. <laughs> Women, children, white, black, everybody's there. And in both cases, the speaker, in this case a politician, in this case uh, 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 preachers, are trying to persuade. And what underlies this is the idea that the people they're trying to persuade are important. Their opinion counts. We can graph the results of this. At the time of the Revolution, there were a handful of people in the United States calling themselves Baptists. There were no Methodists at all. By the end of the 1840s, the Methodists were by far the largest, well, not by far, the Methodists were the largest denomination in the country. Think of this. Coming from nowhere to the largest denomination, the Baptists were a close second. And within a few years, also, there would be the Mormons. Reform crusades always pitch their appeals at every man and every woman. Woman Self-help and mutual aid societies flourished. Experiments in popular education. The, uh, uh, the groundwork was laid for the first public school systems. Poets and philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and later Walt Whitman celebrated the worth of the common man, uh, the individual. And for all this, I would suggest, Andrew Jackson became the symbol and a proper symbol, not so much because of his own beliefs, not because he himself represented the democracy against the aristocracy, but, and this struck Tocqueville, for the very fact of who he was, a self-made, base-born, rough-hewn, poorly educated frontiersman who was elected president of the United States by a popular vote of the people. That fact, Tocqueville said, this can't happen in Europe. It's happened here. And then Jackson solidifies this. And again, it doesn't matter what he meant by it. The fact was that he said it. When he gets up and then governs explicitly in the name of the humble members of society against the aristocracy, we have entered a new and democratic age. Uh, I 
I have that I was supposed to wrap up the speaking presentation part of it at 10.15. Yep. Of course, we left a lot on the cutting room floor.